let's get started. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for coming out. We've got yeah. tough competitions. Thanks for the digits. Today we're fortunate to be joined by Matthew. Thank you. Today we're fortunate to be joined by Peter Henderson, who's completed a joint JD PhD in computer science at Stanford. Uh, Peter studies the interface of machine learning and law, examining how to develop automated systems that can make progress on government and societal prop, uh, problems, such as, very germane to today, um, how to identify which taxpayers the IRS should audit. Um, um, uh, I hope you all thought of that. Uh, Peter also uh, researches legal and public policy issues uh, related to AI, such as uh, whether our colleagues working on large language models are engaged in flagrant large scale copyright infringement. Uh, he's an open philanthropy AI fellow, a uh, fellow at Rank Lab, which is a component of uh, Stanford Law School that uses, among other things, computer science methods to understand regulatory issues. Uh, and at Stanford Law School, he co led the Domestic Violence Pro bono, Pro bono Project and represented criminal defendants uh, who were affected by California's rather notorious three strikes law. So, welcome, Peter. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking to you about aligning machine learning law and policy for responsible real world deployments. So, again, I'm a JD PhD candidate, so uh, this will be sort of interdisciplinary work. And I have to make this disclaimer the views expressed here are my own and not of any government agency, company, or other person. I have to say this because we were partnered with real world agencies. Or large language models. Yes, and large language models. Um, so nowadays, when you do machine learning research, you often find that you put out a paper, and it is rapidly deployed to some product or real world scenario, and that has real societal impact. And nowadays, things can be so rapid that it's in a matter of days, not years. So my research really focuses on two fronts, preventing the harms of machine learning and using machine learning for public good. And that often brings together both law and policy with core machine learning research. And so in this talk, I'm going to tell you about that two-sided uh, story. So using ML for public good and preventing the harms of ML, both with technical approaches and with law and policy approaches. So let's start off with the first thing. So my goal has been to take on big partnership projects for public good with positive real world impact that also help us advance fundamental understanding of machine learning and NLP algorithms. Why do I care about this? Well, I want to make sure that we improve services for the public good. I want to make sure that we innovate in machine learning and NLP. And by working on those hard challenges, that can help us identify problems we might have missed in core research. And I want to understand best practices for responsible AI and AI governance. And working in these real world settings help you really uh, get a holistic picture of what you should be thinking about. And often in machine learning research, sometimes we have company-centric benchmarks uh, in research. And so this also helps balance that out. right? So I'm going to tell you about a case study with the Internal Revenue Service. This is a real world partnership that we had over the last few years where I had a government laptop and I worked closely with the agency. And I'm aware that it is close to tax day, so you've probably been thinking about the Internal Revenue Service a lot, but I promise you this is more exciting than a 1040. Um, and so we worked with the IRS to improve the efficiency and equity of the IRS audit selection process. We wanted to innovate on the sequential decision making uh, front with new settings and new algorithms. And we wanted to understand the distributive impacts of algorithm design decisions in this context. So let me give you a little bit of background. So the IRS is charged with recovering over $450 billion per year in unpaid taxes. This is what's known as the tax gap. In the background of this photo uh, is the IRS cafeteria which has been repurposed to fit all your paper tax returns because they're simply overflowing. Right? So this is a huge scaling problem, $450 billion a year. Uh, <clears throat> and it requires uh, a lot of effort to do. The main mechanism that the IRS uh, has for tackling the tax gap is through audits. Right? So they audit taxpayers and find out whether there was any misreporting on those tax returns. And there's a lot of laws and regulations that uh, the IRS has to comply with when designing algorithms for selecting who to audit. In particular, 
they are charged with reducing the tax gap equitably and efficiently. And in particular, they have to use statistics to select who to audit. And second, they have to estimate the tax gap using an unbiased and low variance estimator. And this is a requirement for reporting uh, to Congress. Right? So you have to have reduced the tax gap equitably and efficiently and estimate the tax gap with an unbiased and low variance estimator. And so because you need to have an unbiased and low variance estimator, this is a scenario in government where the laws and policies actually require us to have theoretical guarantees on sort of unbiasedness and the variance of the estimators. So this is a somewhat interesting setting. The main way that the IRS uses, <coughs> tackles this challenge is through two programs. So every year, they use uh, the National Research Program to select 15,000 random audits. So that's random sampling throughout the population. And then they use a, a linear discriminant analysis model to select the rest of the audits in a program called operational audits. And basically, they're classifying whether a tax return has predicted over $200 in misreporting. So if over $200, that's ranked highly and uh, more likely to be selected for audit. So there's problems. So this is suboptimal, right? Operational audits are unused in estimation. And if you reuse them, you can do re less random sampling. Random sampling gives us unbiased estimators, but it's inefficient, right? And it's not even clear whether using a linear discriminant analysis classifier is the right approach for this problem. And it's also potentially unfair along three different dimensions. So people have noted that it's meritocratically unfair. If you're randomly sampled for audit, you feel that you didn't do anything, why am I being audited? Uh, on the vertical equity front, it's been noted that uh, low-income taxpayers are more likely to be audited than high-income taxpayers. And in horizontal equity, it's been noted that there's disparate impact on black taxpayers versus non-black taxpayers. And so we have unfairness along three dimensions. And so this is fundamentally a sequential decision-making problem. Every year, the IRS audits, <coughs> selects who to audit, they update their models, and then they repeat and repeat and repeat. And so we ideally want to leverage the work that has been ongoing in sequential decision making to help us improve these algorithms and improve this process overall. But nothing really quite maps on to the optimization problem that the IRS has. So instead, we propose a new setting, which we call optimize and estimate structured bandits. A structured bandit is a type of sequential decision making algorithm that I'll explain in a second. But our goal here is to maximize the reward, maximize identified misreporting, which is required by law. So IRS has to do this. And again, we want to minimize the variance of our population estimator and have an unbiased estimator, again, required by law. How do we do this? Let's think about this in the general setting. So if you have a general optimize and estimate structured bandit, uh, we propose that you have many, many arms. So you can pull any arm and each arm comes with a per arm context. So this is some information about that arm. You have to select arms in batches. So at every time step, you select a group of arms together. For each arm, you get a reward using sort of the language of structured bandit settings. And then you have to have your population estimator, including for unselected arms, right? This is your tax gap estimator. And you assume there's a nonlinear underlying mapping from that context to the reward. All right. In the IRS setting, you're maximizing the amount of misreporting. Right? Uh, ma sorry, maximizing the amount of misreporting found. <laughs> um, maybe I should have gra grabbed another copy. Um, so <clears throat> then you want to maintain unbiasedness for your estimator and have a low variance estimate of the tax gap. Um, Yes? Are you maximizing the number of returns on which misreporting is found, or the dollar amount? No, the dollar amount. Is, is that also the right criterion set statutory design to go up? Otherwise, you'd think you'd want to do the, the cost benefit analysis on the, the return per expenditure. Yeah, so, so uh, yes, the, the 
uh, I, the inter internal revenue policy manual states you have to use statistics that predict the amount of misreporting. Um, I can uh, I can flip back after and show you, but um, but there is also a cost benefit analysis that can be conducted. Um, currently, that does not happen in this selection process, and so we're uh, I'm sort of showing you how this maps onto the current structure, and then I'll explain a little bit more later. But happy to get back to that. So uh, a question, you don't have to go back to the, yeah, yeah, sorry. the way this works today, but a question about how this works today in comparison to what you proposed. Mm -hmm. So the, they have this uh, linear classifier that's looking for any misreporting over $200. $200. Yeah. Is there any further prioritization they do after that? Like, you know, they go roughly in order of um, you know, the, the overall amount of income reported, or is it just random selection on top of that? Uh, it's uh, according to the... Uh, likelihood that you have over 200. So it's like a probabilistic classifier, right? Um, there's no further, it's just categorical. Wow. Okay. Um, there are different, I should say that this is a, yeah, I have to make a disclaimer that this is a stylized model and there's more details that, that I can't talk about, but um, not really for in Which terms of- consistent with the uh, taxonomy. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, Right, so in this, if you map on the structure bandit setting to the IRS setting, uh, you have uh, your arms are the tax returns you can audit. The uh, context are the tax return data. So that's 500 covariates from tax return data. And then the reward is the amount of misreporting found after an audit. And then you have your tax gap estimator. And then you're selecting batches of arms at the per year level. So every year you have to do this process over and over and over again. There's a lot more differences between like traditional multi-arm bandits, structure bandit, contextual bandits that I won't really get into here. I'm happy to talk about that uh, offline or afterwards. Uh, but suffice to say that there is a new setting with a different optimization problem that you would traditionally see in sort of the structure bandit or bandit literature. And so we need new algorithms, right? So we first would start off with one uh, algorithm called adaptive bin sampling. And the intuition is something like this. Uh, for every tax return, you use a regressor, a random forest model, a uh, regression model, to predict the amount of misreporting uh, using historical data from the randomly sampled data. Remember, there's an underlying nonlinear structure between the context and the reward that you assume. And we use a random for forest regressor partially for policy reasons, right? There's a little bit more interpretability. Um, and we don't use linear models because linear models, uh, as we find, basically cannot uh, characterize the data well. It's a very nonlinear uh, data. And so if you wanted to do greedy sampling, you would choose the top part of this distribution. You'd have more myopic reward, right? Like you're selecting as, as well as you can model the distribution. But you'd have a biased estimator. If you do random sampling, it's less myopic reward, but you have your unbiased estimator. Ideally, you want to use uh, some sampling theory to help us trade off reward for variance of the estimator, but maintain your unbiasedness. And the way that we do that is we ensure that we have uh, bins that are, uh, give us the exact probabilities of selection in the batch setting. Uh, because you need exact probabilities for ensuring unbiasedness in the batch setting. And so if you have bins that are a particular uh, size, the size of the batch that you're selecting, you can ensure unbiasedness using something like inverse propensity weighting for your estimator. You have some freedom to uh, cluster the distribution in different ways uh, for the strata, but uh, we use a nearest neighbor type clustering approach. And remember, you have to sample at the lowest part of that distribution because you need your unbiased estimator. So there can be no uh, part of the distribution that has uh, zero probability of being sampled. Strata are also desirable for other institutional policy reasons. Uh, some reporting requirements require that there be strata uh, to understand the breakdown of auditing. Uh, and so there's actually some other policy, good policy reasons why you might want strata within the current context of the IRS's structure. Um, I'm happy to get into that 
uh, afterwards as well. So again, the reason we need these bends is because we need theoretical guarantees on the unbiasedness of the estimator. And then we can add some functions to start to smooth out or change that distribution so that the IRS uh, can uh, give up some reward for additional uh, reduction in variance on the estimator. For example, you can mix it with a logistic function, or you can combine it with other exploration techniques like Thompson sampling or upper confidence bound sampling. And this helps you trade off uh, reward for variance. And so when you compare something like this against the status quo system, where again, you have your national research program, which is a small epsilon sample, and the operational audits, were a bit, which are basically a greedy sample, so you have an epsilon greedy approach. You evaluate on real IRS data, where we had to you know, uh, get an IRS laptop and work with on government servers. Um, if you evaluate the unreal IRS data, you find that uh, using something that like adaptive bin sampling reduces variance by 20% over the status quo. It yields about 1.5 times the amount of reward as the current status quo system. And we can give up some reward to get further variance reduction by using that mixing function that I talked about. So for example, we can give up 1% of reward per year to get a further 15% reduction in variance, but there's a nonlinear trade-off after that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Did you say something about the high value of the ground truth in the data set because you don't really know the actual risk reporting? Uh, right? Is the data set pruned to only focus on audits and their results and less the ground truth? I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. So, so remember, we have the national research program over the last few years. So, uh, this gives us a, a random sample over the distribution over the last few years. So, we can actually um, evaluate on that data, which models the distribution of uh, the actual population, right? So you're sort of using, you're leveraging the fact that we have random sampling over the last nine, 10 years to help us do this evaluation. Or in other words, the ground truth is not whether there's misreporting, it's whether there's an audit would detect misreporting. Yes, absolutely. No, 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 that's, I mean, that's a really great point. Um, and we're working within the constraints of the fact that the IRS has to do audits and those audits um, are imperfect, right? Uh, and in fact, they're imperfect in heterogeneous ways and we're doing some follow-up work to investigate that. When you make the prediction, mm -hmm. are you making use of data on some current tax year or is it historical? It's historical as well. So you assume that you've, it's a sequential decision-making problem. So you assume you have whatever data you've used uh, you've selected in past years. So it's like a policy evaluation kind of thing. I have a question about the sampling for the National Research Program, the existing thing. You call it random sampling. Do you mean simple random sampling, or is that stratified random sampling? It is stratified according to some pre-specified strata uh, that are, yeah, they're called activity codes, yeah. and they sort of are strata, but they're uh, a little complicated and not optimized uh, in any way. They're sort of for but reporting. You said that there are reporting requirements by strata. Mm -hmm. So in some way, are they optimized for that reporting requirement? Uh, and so are you giving up some interpretability when you stratify in this different way? So the strata are like less than $200,000 TPI, more than two hundred. dollars like 200 to 400, they're mostly around the total positive income. So it's basically income-based strata. Yeah. You are giving up a little bit of interpretability because you now have many more covariates, right? And you're breaking down the strata along different dimensions, but you're getting improvements in the optimization space. So th the fact that there are strata is still helpful and you can use those for reporting, but you lose some of that interpretability that you get with the simplified strata uh, that exists for the NRP program. Okay. Um, and so if you scale this up to the full op audit program, you know, because you have 1.5 X reward, you'll get about one to two billion extra dollars per year because you've simply uh, done a better job of shifting up to the top part of the distribution. We have a lot more analysis in the paper examining uncertainty sampling, different other methods and different approaches. Um, 
But I wanted to also talk to you about uh, some of the fairness dimensions that we mentioned. So again, the reason to shift the distribution up uh, toward the top part of the distribution is also because um, there is a, uh, because random sampling is undesirable from that meritocratic fairness perspective, right? Um, you don't necessarily uh, want to be randomly sampled for auditing. And so this shifts things away from that a little bit. Uh, along the horizontal equity front, uh, my co-authors dug into some of our findings a little bit more uh, and found that the current LDA approach has disparate impact on black taxpayers. So black taxpayers are more likely to be audited under the current system, um, even though uh, when you compare uh, sort of causally. And so uh, if you change the optimization problem to this problem and you're optimizing, uh, including the magnitude of misreporting, you also remove that disparate impact as well. Um, and so you can check out their paper for that. Um, but we find also that it aligns with vertical equity. And so uh, there is a correlated shift, even though we didn't explicitly optimize for it, uh, that changing this optimization problem also targets about 1.5 times more total positive income, right? And so there's a shift along vertical equity as well, um, though that's a policy also decision to be made. We're helping understand how these design decisions affect distributive effects. Yeah. Right, so it goes back to the LDA algorithm. Remember, it predicts uh, whether or not there's $200 or, of misreporting or more. And so if you do that, um, that's one source of the problem, right? Because you're not taking into account the magnitude of that misreporting. So basically, the income shift is also correlated with that disparate impact. Uh, we also see um, an oversampling of EITC claimants which uh, because there are reporting requirements uh, to get unbiased estimators, and actually there are more reporting requirements that I didn't talk about today. There's actually a per credit reporting requirement. So if you want an unbiased estimator of the EITC tax credit, for example, uh, you need to sample in that region, and that also ends up exacerbating that. So the shifts uh, we suggest right, move away from that sort of system uh, and also correlate uh, better along these dimensions of equity. Um, and we have more analysis again in the paper. So this was one mechanism to shift uh, away from that epsilon greedy algorithm and improve on this new, sorry, on this new optimize and estimate structure bandit problem. Another approach would be to use entropy regularized Pareto sampling so remember, for that unbiasedness guarantee, because we want an unbiased estimator, you have to have exact probabilities in the batch setting. But actually, uh, if you prove uh, by induction the regret bounds of that sequential decision-making algorithm, you prove that basically the regret or the amount of reward that you missed because of that change scales with the size of the bins. Right? So the bigger the bins, the more regret you're giving up. Um, <clears throat> And uh, so ideally, we'd want to get rid of those bins, right? Um, and we can do a little bit of a better job in sampling that distribution by looking at another version of this problem. So instead of maximizing reward and minimizing variance, we can maximize reward and maximize the entropy of that sampling distribution. And this has uh, nice intuitions that uh, have also been leveraged in policy gradient methods for proving convergence of policy gradient and reinforcement learning. Basically, the intuition is that entropy drives probabilities away from zero, uh, ensuring that you have good coverage throughout that distribution. You can use an approach called Pareto sampling to get, then get bi uh, bounded bias or bounded error on your probabilities in the batch setting. And that gives you bounds on bias for your estimator. Right? So because you have a bounded error for your exact probabilities of sampling, you have bounded bias in the batch setting. So this is an interesting convergence that I won't really get into between sort of reinforcement learning 
literature and sampling literature, uh, which I think is pretty cool and uh, helps us bring together these different approaches. Yep. Just a question of clarification. Mm -hmm. So it's, it seemed like before you were saying unbiased estimates are required by law, and mm -hmm. then here it seemed like the estimates are no longer unbiased. Yeah. So it brings up a good policy question for should the agency be OK with changing to a policy with bounded bias? So we did this as follow-on work, trying to solve the general setting um, separate from the IRS work. So we're trying to solve just from a pure general optimizing estimate structure bandit setting. This is a new setting, so we're trying to come up with different approaches to solve it. Um, and so I think that begs the question, you know, are we OK with a biased estimator or bounded bias, for example? Um, and I think that's something that we're exploring right now to understand better uh, why those requirements are there, whether there can be some uh, leeway to that at all. Also back, backing up a little bit, mm -hmm. like what are the underlying uh, assumptions of some of these algorithms with respect to like, what it assumes about people's experiences and so forth? Like, mm -hmm. I think about a multi bandit setting, mm -hmm. and like I'm pulling the arms of machines to figure out like what is the distribution of the war of that machine, mm -hmm. right? So no, uh, so so this is not the traditional. So uh, going back to that slide where I said this is not the traditional multi-arm bandit, this is not the traditional multi-arm bandit. You assume that there is a nonlinear structure between sort of the tax return information and the amount of misreporting. So you assume that there is some signal between uh, tax return information that's on your, you know, tax returns, the 1040, and the reward, and that's sort of also the current assumption. Uh, for the existing status quo system because, um, and, and there, there is definitely some correlation, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see this improvement in uh, auditing, right? And so there is an assumption that there is some relationship. That is a partially observable assumption, I would say, and there's a lot of additional uh, work to investigate the strength of that assumption for uh, you know, all parts of that data. Are there other inputs? Like, presumably, people's past misreporting, like, also So there are not currently other inputs. Um, and so we're moving one step on top of the status quo system and improving it. Uh, history is not included in the current setup. Um, and neither is a lot of external information that is also available to the IRS that they don't um, use for this. So it's really mostly stuff on the 1040. Um, it's for both bureaucratic and uh, administrative sort of reasons. Uh, I will say that there is work to improve that overall by thinking about what data is going in there. Um, I think, yeah, questions of, I, I can't get back to questions of data and what you're using in these models, but uh, there's various uh, administrative and bureaucratic reasons why you might not want more data linkage than is happening on the 1040 for, for all sorts of reasons. OK. Um, so this is also a broadly generalizable setting. right? We might think of uh, using it to improve language models over time. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm, you'll see in a second why I'm pivoting a little bit to language models. and so. For example, if you have a system like ChatGPT or whatever language you want, you, want uh, you might want to improve the model over time. So between model updates, you want to find and fix the worst model mistakes. And you want an unbiased and low variance estimate of model quality. So you might have the user queries and model responses as your arms. And you might have the text of the query or response as your uh, context, and you might have some rating of how bad the response was as your reward, and then you have an estimate of model quality. Right? So this is a broadly generalizable setting, even though we sort of uh, tackle it uh, and propose it as a new setting uh, in the context of the IRS. And then your time step would be the model updates. And so we set out with this case study to improve the efficiency and equity of the audit selection process. Uh, we did some of that. Uh, we have more. Uh, improvements along multiple fronts. Uh, we innovated on the sequential decision making with a new setting, the optimize and estimate structure bandit, and some new algorithms for that. 
And we wanted to understand the distributive impacts of the algorithmic design decisions. So we discovered that LDA, uh, the current system, has this distribution shift that is um, from if you switch to a regression model. So our work has had real world impact. So uh, our research is actively being incorporated into the IRS audit selection process. Um, <clears throat> And this is an example of where you might need theoretical guarantees for real world law and policy settings. And we learned a little bit more about aligning algorithmic research with what law and policy requires. This is actually like a real uh, high priority thing. The new IRS commissioner, Werfel, in uh, his Senate hearing uh, was asked questions by New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez uh, about how they're gonna address equity and efficiency in audit selection. Our work is a key part of that and tackling those issues. And so there's actually a rapid desire to address some of this. So there's more work to be done and is this a high priority for the IRS. So we took on a, a big partnership project uh, with uh, a real partner in the real world to tackle some ML research. Um, we have new partnerships spinning up with the US Patent Trademark Office, Santa Clara County, and the Department of Treasury. And I'm hoping in the future I can also partner with public interest law and policy clinics to use ML in different ways to help uh, tackle some hard challenges in these areas. And there's a real desire with all of the hype to use foundation models to help tackle some of these challenges for public good. And I think in some cases they may actually be useful. So uh, what I call foundation models, you can also think of as large pre-trained models, large language models, what have you. And generally the feature of these types of models is that they're trained on tons and tons of data. Uh, and then they can be quickly adapted to a bunch of downstream tasks where there might not be as much data. And so you might think about the positive uh, mechanisms for using these models, for example, you might wanna spot errors in administrative adjudication. So again, uh, agencies, uh, like the Social Security Administration make decisions on a daily basis. And the remand rate, which with a lot of nuance, I'm gonna call the error rate, uh, for uh, the, those decisions about 50%, right? So that's not great. So we might wanna improve on that and spot errors before they have to be remanded. 87% of patents are given a non-final rejection, which is basically a revise and resubmit uh, on application. So we might think about helping patent examiners and filers check claims for obvious errors. So saving, uh, improving the efficiency over the, of the overall system. And so these might be the positive use cases, but there's a problem. So foundation models are often trained on massive data sets and can output harmful materials if you use them in generative contexts. So we've shown over the last few years that they can output private information, hate speech and toxicity, and even intellectual property. In a recent work, we showed that if you prompt GPT-4, you can get extract about three and a half chapters of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, right? And so that brings me to the next part of my talk preventing the harms of machine learning. As much as we wanna use these models, these big models, for uh, these good use cases, we wanna make sure that they're not doing harm. And so first, I wanna ask, is there a scalable way to learn to follow laws and policies? And second, is there a way to impede adversaries from repurposing these models for harmful purposes? So let's tackle the first part. So what are the current solutions uh, for model creators for how to prevent these sort of harmful outputs of models. So one approach has been data filtering. Uh, I was involved with a, an open source, open source effort uh, called Bloom for a, a large language model. And as part of that, we recommended uh, some data filtering strategies to remove some information uh, that might be harmful. But, uh, and you might also wanna try fine tuning or reinforcement for learning from human feedback. This is sort of the approach that ChatGPT takes. But the problem is you need lots and lots of data to make lots of contextual decisions about what can come in and what can come out of the model. Um, and that data is hard to find and hard to scale. And so you either have to uh, get lots of labelers to label all that data um, or uh, find some other way to scale. And if, even if you get all, a lot of labelers to label all that data, you might not have good coverage, right? Um, there might be all sorts of scenarios that you didn't think of. 
So is there a mechanism to help scale? So uh, our solution was to propose leveraging court and administrative data to learn contextual strategies for filtering, for example. So courts and administrative agencies follow laws and policies on a regular basis, weighing, for example, whether you should pseudonymize a given document. Right, so courts and administrative agencies will decide whether to balance the how to balance the privacy interests against uh, the transparency interests. And there's thousands of decisions reflecting and even explaining how to follow these laws and policies. So for example, the Executive Office of Immigration Review um, will sometimes release a, an opinion under matter of ABC as a pseudonym for the person. And in federal court, sometimes they'll use Jane Doe or another pseudonym to protect the identity of the person. But this is not something that we typically do when we see uh, filtering before training a language model on data. Right? So filtering for privacy in language models has typically been sort of regular expressions for basic things like social security numbers. So to see if this is possible, we collected about 290 gigabytes of uh, legal data. Uh, I'll mention that this is also useful for learning how to do legal reasoning, which is useful for some of those public good settings, but we can talk about that later. We identify the privacy uh, laws and rules that apply to each subset of that data. So what are the laws that have governed how that filtering was applied to that subset of data? And then we trained a model uh, on extracted pseudonymity decisions for example, in the Executive Office of Immigration Review context. And so when you apply that to out of distribution data, you see some logical consistency with the court's actual standard. If you use, for example, biographies, uh, and then you append perturbations, uh, such as sentences saying that that person is seeking asylum or that person experienced torture, the model's probability of recommending a pseudonym goes up. And that is in line with the Code of Federal Regulation, which says the Executive Office of Immigration Review should not reveal information about asylum seekers or people who experience torture. And so this was implicitly learned from the decisions of the court, even though we never really told it the actual standard. Uh, <clears throat> and we have sort of um, semi-supervised data to learn from. And so we can have some way to scale up some types of contextual reasoning, contextual filtering decisions for how we might want to filter data. Now, it's you know, imperfect, and there's more work to be done. But it gives us some way to think about what are these sort of contextual decisions that we might have missed if we only filtered for social security numbers as regular expressions. There's a lot more decision making that should go on. Um, and this gives some way to start to scale that up a little bit. And we have a large uh, data set of legal data that can, we can continue improving and incorporating more methods to help uh, on this legal reasoning and analogical reasoning ability. And there's a lot more analysis in the paper that uh, I won't really get into, but uh, this has had some big impact already. So uh, the next generation of foundation models are trained partly on this data. Um, and they have shown to improve performance on legal reasoning tasks. We show this in the mass language model setting, but it also um, uh, there's work ongoing to show it in the autoregressive setting. And this sort of serves as a pipeline for future public good tasks. So agencies like the USPTO have reached out to us to include data in pile of law to make sure that the next generation of foundation models uh, are pre-trained in a way that can tackle some of those hard challenges that I said at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, should I indicate the first point here as saying that the data set that you made available is now part of the training data set in the P4, or should I interpret that to say that the filtering we tools that you uncovered based mm -hmm. on your data set are now part of the So, so I, yeah, there's two tracks. I think. Uh, this point is more about the data set itself for like legal reasoning capability. So it's used for pre-training. The filtering rules, um, we are working on scaling up. 
So we're trying to figure out ways to better scale that up to a bunch of more. So we, we showed it in the Executive Office of Immigration Review Pseudonymity Standard, but there's a lot more sort of considerations of contextual decisions, and so we're working on scaling that up a bit more. And so in the future, in, with autoregressive language models, uh, we want to be able to tackle these hard reasoning tasks, uh, such as reasoning about actions to determine, oh, sorry. So I was wondering if you could say something about how you think about the imperfections of the Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gender. Yes, yes. There's only a handful of JD PhDs in one Yes, yes, yes. Open AI philosophy affects one person. Yes, yeah. So um, when the model recommends pseudonymity, so, so th this actually goes back to some uh, policy questions about how courts handle pseudon pseudonymization in general. Uh, and I think the recommendation would be if a model recommends pseudonymity in this context, in that if it is considered to be harmful to use someone's identity, you need to do a lot more than uh, just masking out the name, right? Uh, because, and there are some mechanisms for doing some of that. Uh, they're not perfect, uh, I would say, but I think you, it's not just about masking the name, it's about making the decision, like having that contextual decision of, okay, there's something harmful here that we need to think about filtering out. Um, exactly how is there's more layers on top of that. Or another mm -hmm. way of answering that question is do judges take into account the ease of re identifying information when making these decisions? And have you learned the answer to the question I just asked by interpreting your model? Um, in some cases, they do take into account whether information is public uh, that would, could make you re-identify it, uh, the data. But I will say the court standard for how they filter and how they de-identify information is imperfect, right? So there is a balancing uh, happening. But um, I think this is also something I didn't talk about, but I think is useful is using this data to analyze what types of decisions the court is actually making, what is the actual standard of the court, and better understanding whether that can also be improved, like feeding back into the law some of this analysis and understanding. Yeah, I had a question on that. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a sense of what the error rate is of the judges themselves in making these kinds of decisions? Do they try to model the data? Yeah, so we're um, actively exploring that because in, in doing this, we discovered some interesting insights into what is the model suggests is happening when the courts are analyzing these uh, pseudonymity decisions. Uh, I don't have any stats on that right now, but we're actively exploring it. A question of clarification. Mm -hmm. So when you say the pile of blood had a big impact, could you clarify what you mean by that? Yeah, so I think the next generation of foundation models is using it. Um, and so this is you know large-scale language models, and so I think we will see uh, in the next generation. I, and I, I can't talk about some of the things because of various <laughs> NDAs and things like that, but uh, some of the next generation financial models is using that. And we've seen that uh, in-domain legal reasoning type tasks see big jumps in, in performance improvements. So by training on in-domain data, you can tackle more of the legal type tasks that we want them to handle for those public good settings like I mentioned at the top of the section. Or to put it another way, the language models that have recently passed the bar exam, are they the ones already trained with your data set? Or have uh, you tried to break some of them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, we don't know for sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, in the future, right, you have these generative models. They can uh, begin to start to do something like legal reasoning. Um, and so one thing that I'm hoping that we can start to do is leverage some of the uh, implicit supervision from legal data to help reason about agent outputs. So when a generative model outputs something, can it also output an analysis about whether that output itself is violating any of the laws and policies you want to specify for it? Um, I think we have a lot to do before we uh, 
get there, basically. Um, so I think we need new and efficient techniques for noisy learning uh, from, from, sorry, from learning from noisy legal and administrative data as implicit guidance. Uh, and I think we need better analogical reasoning capabilities. Uh, I think that reinforcement learning uh, and self-supervision techniques can help us get there. They're not the single solution, but I, I uh, have a lot of hope for that. And in fact, I've done a lot of other reinforcement learning work that I think could help in getting there. And ideally, we want this to work even with smaller models because in agency context, you can't really call out to an API uh, within some company necessarily. And so you might want it to be able to reason even with smaller models and in multimodal settings. And so uh, I hope to basically be able to scale uh, this sort of reasoning ability, thinking about, for example, pseudonymity decisions or rules and laws in general to make sure that we can uh, have these models that can reason about laws and policies. But even if you had models that at inference time can reason about whether they're violating some law or policy uh, and stop outputting that information, adversaries can come in and adapt the model to some harmful uses. And so this is something that we've seen already. So for example, uh, GPTJ, a 6 billion parameter model, was tra trained on 4chan data and then deployed to post to 4chan, right? And then Meta tried to restrict access to one of their language models uh, through sort of a gatekeeping mechanism, and that uh, got immediately le leaked to BitTorrent. <laughs> um, and so access controls can only go so far. So we really need to make sure that the model parameters themselves have as many uh, roadblocks to prevent adversaries from repurposing them for harm, even when you have direct access to the model. And this may seem impossible, and it is quite difficult, but we propose a sort of new approach, which again, you're not trying to uh, prevent the adversary from ever being able to use the model, but you're trying to increase the costs of adapting to harmful tasks and decrease the after adapted performance while still performing well on your desired tasks. And the intuition in optimization space is something like this. So you have two loss curves, your desired task loss in blue, the harmful task loss in red, right? If you're optimizing a model, you might pre-train it and it might fall somewhere like here. And using standard gradient descent you will get to this optimum. But you will also be able to quickly adapt through fine tuning to this harmful task optimum that's good as well. Instead, you might want to put the model somewhere like here, where you still get to your desired task optimum, but when you use standard gradient descent, it's much harder to optimize out of that space. Right? So you're trying to plan to put the model over here uh, if you can put the model in two positions that are uh, good for the desired task. So you might want to do something simple, like one-step adversarial censoring. So this is a simplified version of that, but you might want to take your desired task loss and the negative harmful task loss and optimize that way, right? So you're just unlearning information about the harmful task. But the problem is that puts you at the top of this curve, right? And even though you've added a few extra steps, you can quickly optimize to that bottom uh, of the loss curve. Instead, what you want to do is something a bit more complicated. Remember, you want to plan out. So you put your model into a hard optimization space for the harmful task that's still easy to optimize for the desired task. And you can do that with uh, what we call meta-learned adversarial censoring. And there's an algorithm on the left. You don't really need to read it. I'll walk you through it. So you have your foundation model parameters theta. And you have a bag of harmful task adaptation methods. This includes hyperparameter searches, prompt tuning, all sorts of methods that are useful for tuning foundation models. You sample from that bag of uh, harmful ad task adaptation methods. And then you get a series of derivative models that are increasingly better at the harmful task. And so then <clears throat> you will also get a series of losses, right? 
that are conditioned on each of those parameters and also conditional on the original parameters because you have a series of gradient optimization steps that help you get to the spot. And so what you can do is you can flip the loss of that, add your desired task loss, take the gradient. But remember, all of this is conditional on the original model parameters. So you're actually back propagating through all those optimization processes to plan to put your model into that really difficult optimization spot for the harmful tasks. You back proc through all of that. Uh, we also have some additional features that basically make, give the adversary an advantage during training to make this process a bit more stable. Uh, I won't really get into those, and we have a lot more uh, sort of detail in the paper on that. But that's the high level idea. And so we use the bias, uh, bias and bios data set, uh, which has biographies. And in that setting, the desired task is to predict the profession of the biography. And the block task, or the harmful task, is to predict gender. right? And so this gives us a, a setting where you have two tasks on a single data set. And so what we find is that, again, if you do the zero step approach, uh, you can recover the optimum pretty quickly. It still helps a little bit. But the more steps on that inner loop that you take, the more gradient updates you do in harmful adaptation before you backprop all the way through, the better you're planning from putting the model uh, to the top of that hill where it's still easy to optimize to, to the bottom of that hill, or to that uh, sort of volcano shape uh, optimization space. And so what happens is that if you take 16 steps on the uh, inner loop, it performs just about as a randomly initialized model. So if you just reset the model completely, which is what you would do if you're trying to uh, you know, bypass all these restrictions, then that's about as uh, bad as you do. But you retain the strong performance on the desired task since you've optimized your loss for that. Um, I think this is just like an initial approach, and there's a lot more to scale this up and generalize it. But the fact that we can see this improvement with the inner, lo uh, inner loop means that meta-learning can help us plan in the optimization space. Yes? I have a question of clarification on the last results. What, mm -hmm. what was the x-axis? The sample size? Uh, the data set size. So, so basically, you're trying to make it more expensive for an adversary. So you're trying to force them to get more data for, um, uh, you, you're making sure that you have worse performance with less data. So basically, increase the data cost to the adversary. And this is the data for fine tuning. Um, the number of labels, gender labels, and things like that. Sure. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it's the data sets partition three ways to make sure there's no uh, overfitting. Yeah. So, here's, uh, this result shows the ability of uh, your approach to uh, reduce the gender accuracy. What's, what's the impact on the benign ability? Um, so, yeah, so because we have um, the desired task loss in the um, optimization spot, you still do, you actually do better than the original model because you've trained on the desired task. Right, so we, we have the desired task class in here. Um, and so this is just an initial step, uh, right? So you have the desired task class, so you retain your accuracy on that desired task. So, so I imagine that if you think about a baseline approach, you mm -hmm. also have access to this desired task. Yeah. It doesn't account Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? If you think about a baseline approach that also has access to this desired task, mm -hmm. I imagine that the accuracy of that approach on the desired task would be even higher because it's a simple optimization problem. It just needs to perform well on the desired task. Yeah. It has no consideration for the other sort of task. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what is the delta between that accuracy oh, I see. and the accuracy? Um, yes, we have that in the paper. Uh, on the delta on the harmful task, it's about the same. Task. Sorry? The delta on the desired task. Uh, the delta on the desired task is, sorry, we have it in the paper. Uh, I'm happy to show you after, but it basically it's um, uh, you, you see about like a five ten percent uh, improvement over the base model on the desired task. I, I think Pratik, you're asking a slightly different question, which is essentially if you did a domain adaptation for the desired task. Mm -hmm. On top of the pre-trained model, yeah. How does that compare to the domain adaptation in this way that accounts for the harmful task? I see. Uh, it's about the same. Okay. Yeah. 
So like if you yeah if you just fine tune on the desired task and you don't have this uh, extra thing, you get about the same increase in performance um, with the confidence intervals you know overlapping. Yeah. To what extent do you have to like, know what the harmful task someone might? Yeah. So the exactly so that's a limitation right? You have to sort of game out what would be the harmful tasks uh, and be able to optimize for that. Um, I don't really see a way around that, right? Like if you're trying to plan in this optimization space and there's a space of tasks that you don't want the model to be able to do, you need some way to like model that space of tasks. Um, so there might be a way to get around that, but I, as of right now, you sort of need to understand the, the harmful tasks you're trying to block. Um, so really quickly, that brings me to my last point, which is how do we law leverage laws and regulations? Uh, so even if we've done all this work to try to you know, uh, filter out uh, contextual private information, maybe we do self-destructing models to make sure we've adapted the model in this way, how do we ensure responsible oversight of deployment? Why do we care about this? So for example, if you don't have an attentive human in the loop in high stakes settings, this could cause real harms. Right? So an example is the Dutch government uh, used a model for algorithmic benefits adjudication. That model automatically flagged benefits claims. The adjudicators just rubber stamped decisions without really thinking twice about it. And this led to large scale harms because there was an error prone system in place that wasn't being validated. We recently showed that if you uh, leverage some administrative law, which is uh, a, around the Administrative Procedure Act, which is a law that governs federal agencies in the United States, we can help use that doctrine to keep an attentive human in the loop. So under administrative law, you have this distinction between rulemaking and guidance, right? So in rulemaking, you have to go through something called notice and comment, which is expensive, it's slow, but it's more democratic to some extent, and you have standing to challenge court. Um, uh, sorry, you have standing to challenge those rules in court if they don't address the inputs of the public. To distinguish between rulemaking and guidance, uh, you have to make sure that that document that you present is not practically binding. And so you can apply the same logic to algorithmic uh, rulemaking versus algorithmic guidance. And so if you have a, an algorithm in that loop instead of a document, you can now start to think about if the algorithm is just being rubber stamped and that decision is basically being made by the algorithm without that human exercising the discretion, that's not really uh, that is practically binding, and it's not really in compliance with the Administrative Procedure Act because it's more uh, like rulemaking. Uh, this lines up with recent case law uh, from, the, uh, from various agencies. And you can then provide a, pr a set of checks uh, to assess whether there are uh, indicators that this is encouraging automation bias, whether it's more rule-like and whether the human is actually exercising their discretion in that loop. So for example, is the algorithm optimized for influencing humans, or is it optimized for some ground truth? Is, the, uh, is it easy to override the algorithm's decision, or are there mechanisms in place to force you to comply with whatever the algorithm says? For example, in some contexts, you have to get manager approval to override whatever the algorithm's recommendation is. And uh, all sorts of other different structural uh, and procedural checks can be used to help assess between whether it's rulemaking or guidance. And so by using this, we can incentivize <clears throat> having an attentive human in the loop uh, so that that human does not fall into automation bias and just rubber stamp whatever the algorithm is saying. So I won't really get more into that, but we've done a lot more to think about how uh, to govern AI and administrative policy around AI. So I'm happy to chat about that offline. Uh, and also, I, I want to mention that evaluation is a really important part of responsible deployment. And so we've done a lot of work on that uh, as well. Uh, and we've had a lot of impact in this area. Uh, for example, the reproducibility checklist at uh, machine learning conferences is the result of some early work we did on reproducibility. 
uh, and various policymakers have discussed with us how to uh, do trustworthy and holistic and rigorous evaluation. So summing up, right? I want to continue in the future to do more work in this area where we prevent the harms of machine learning and use machine learning uh, for public good. Specifically, like I mentioned, we have these additional partnerships spinning up. Uh, to help these partners, we will need to introduce new technical methods for building capable systems, including multimodal analogical reasoning. And I think reinforcement learning can help with that, as well as self-supervision with foundation models. And we need efficient strategy-proof decision-making. Uh, this is just more uh, research that we need to do in reinforcement learning. And really, uh, I want to make sure that we have uh, benchmarks in machine learning research that are aligned with public interest instead of company interests. So I want to do wor more work in that. I also think, in general, to prevent harms, I want to um, help scale up those uh, law and policy following mechanisms, leverage RL uh, for improved capabilities, and that sort of <coughs> analogical reasoning and law and policy following capability. And uh, scaling up this idea of self-destructing models to make it more generalizable, more able to scale so that we can plan better in that foundation model optimization space and move them away from being able to do the sort of harmful tasks that you might want to adapt them to. And for all of this, we need better evaluation, holistic, rigorous, and also robust to gamesmanship because there's often a lot of incentive to game metrics, especially in legal contexts. And there's more legal and policy work to be done. For example, I think it is an outstanding question of whether administrative agencies can actually use foundation models that are trained on the whole internet. There's a whole series of regulations uh, that govern that that I don't think we've waded through and figured out exactly how that would work. And for the private sector, uh, like Jonathan talked about in the beginning, uh, we've done a lot of work in thinking about how laws like copyright interact with things like foundation models. And I think there's a lot more work to be done because uh, these systems are being deployed rapidly and, and coming into contact with laws and policies very quickly. And so I think there's a lot more work to be done there. And lastly, I want to mention that I do a lot of work in engagement, so working with po uh, partners like federal agencies, working with policymakers. So thinking about safety in contexts like the Department of Defense, where we've talked with them about uh, there was an effort to push for the use of machine learning in the nuclear command and control system. So we made sure to organize an effort uh, to and inform policymakers about the potential risks of using machine learnings in such huge high stakes contexts and preventing some of that. Uh, I also do a lot of teaching and outreach. So a lot of our students uh, for classes, uh, we have interdisciplinary classes that I co-teach. Right now I'm co-teaching a class on social harms of NLP. Uh, and there's a lot of interest in regulation uh, and use for public good. And so we do our best to uh, get students to work uh, in these high impact settings. And uh, as Jonathan mentioned, I do a lot of community work. I led the Stanford Domestic Violence Pro Bono Project. I also worked with the Stanford uh, Native Law Pro Bono Project and the Three Strikes Project um, to just support local communities, because I think that's really important. Um, and this work wouldn't be possible without many wonderful co-authors. So thanks so much. And please check out their work as well. Thank you. So you, you had a few partners uh, mm -hmm. lined up for future work. Yep. Um, Santa Fe was one. Yep. USPTO. Yep. Treasury. Yeah, Treasury is another one. Okay. Yep. What is that? Okay. So um, Santa Clara County has a really hard scaling problem of there's a new law that requires going back through all uh, deeds and removing all restrictive uh, racially restrictive covenants and covenants that discriminate along several different dimensions. So basically, um, in California, there is a history of discriminative uh, uh, restrictive covenants, which basically say that a person of some group, some demographic group, cannot reside in this house. And so over, um, whenever somebody buys a house, you have to sign that deed that says uh, that you of that demographic group can't live there. And you know this is, 
uh, has a lot of harms, has a lot of historical harms. So the California legislature passed a law that uh, requires all counties to go back through and remove all that discriminatory language. And so they have to go document by document and remove that. Right now, they have a lot of uh, these deeds have been scanned in, but right now they're basically doing it by hand. So every one by one, millions and millions of these deeds, they're trying to remove this language. And so what we're doing is we're trying to leverage um, some of the techniques that I just talked about to help uh, find and identify uh, this sort of restrictive discriminatory language and remove it. Uh, in particular, these models have to generalize to very, very noisy scanned in data that's all sort of scribbled on and diagrams and all sorts of complicated things. Um, and they have to generalize to new types of restrictive covenants. So there, you know, there's a lot of very like customized discriminatory restrictive covenants. And so the models have to be able to generalize to catch all of those. And so uh, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, for patent and trademark office, there's a really hard scaling challenge uh, for both discovering prior art, but also for matching examiners who have a very particular set of expertise to the patents that come in. And that matching problem is a sequential problem. There are incentives to game that matching process to get the examiner that you prefer. And um, right now, the status quo system is that uh, somebody hand labels which category they think the patent is in, and that gets routed to a team that then tries to do their best to route it to an expert. So it's a, a, a process that can be improved, but there's really interesting sequential decision-making aspects of this, right? There's an incentive to game that assignment process. You have to do assignment with natural language data. Um, and so there's a lot of different like sort of ML type tasks in there. Uh, the work with Treasury uh, is still being spun up, uh, but it's sort of also in partnership with the IRS, sort of continuing the work that I just talked about in thinking about um, how to prioritize uh, some aspects of auditing that I, I can't get super into right now, but yeah. This is really fascinating and exciting to think about all these new application areas. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you can imagine a graduate student comes to you and says, I love this style of work. This is really exciting. This is what I want to do. What would you advise that student about some of the limitations or difficulty that you encounter in doing this style of work? Yeah, so I think um, one of the challenges is uh, building out the partnerships is really difficult and maintaining them, right? Um, this is working with real world systems, real world data. I have to have an IRS laptop that I have to carry around with me if I want to work on that project. So there are some challenges. We've built out mechanisms through sort of repeated experience with this work to try to smooth out some of those things. So we try to as much as we can, for example, with the structured um, bandit setting, we tried to create a general setting that you can work on as a machine learning problem in general, improve the capabilities there, and then that can transfer in easily. So we sort of have like a way to have mirrored work in generalized settings so that we can improve on that and uh, uh, have it be a bit smoother overall. But, uh, but yeah, I think also you just, uh, they're sort of like timing constraints, right? Uh, these things need to happen on a certain timeline with real world partners. And so uh, you need to push uh, to make those things happen uh, as well as sort of data access, partnership constraints and things like that. So uh, happy to talk offline more about that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there was a push. Uh, so the nuclear command and control system was revamped recently. And there was a push to modernize the system. And there was a call for contractors to pitch how you would use AI to improve this process. And then you can imagine a lot of people pitched different types of algorithms um, and different types of uh, systems, analyzing satellite imagery, for example, uh, and various different types of approaches uh, for using AI in that setting. Um, on different components. The, the nuclear command and control system is, is sort of like a system of systems. Uh, and basically, there's like a lot of little components, everything from satellite analysis to denoising to um, uh, 
sort of vetting of personnel who have access to the system. And there were pitches to basically uh, use AI within various different components like those. Um, yeah. Or maybe the side. <laughs> I'm curious, how do you think about notions of verification uh, when it comes to the, the use of machine learning and the types of applications that you are describing? So for example, in the pseudonymity rule filter that you talked about, machine learning can make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious like, how uh, ML making mistakes uh, in a policy perspective interfaces with current rule making that happens. Yeah, so I yeah, so I think it really depends on the context, like how you're using it, and this really de like highly dependent on the context, right? So for example, um, the rulemaking versus guidance distinction that I mentioned quickly at the end, um, that's for people who make decisions, like you know, um, judgments about a particular case, right? They're like judges. And so in that context, right, if you just replace the human with an algorithm, right, you get something like the Dutch uh, government, which had an al algorithm with a human in the loop that wasn't really paying attention. And there was a lot of error prone decisions that had uh, large consequences. And so for those types of systems, you want to make sure you have the structures in place so that if, you know, the, so that the, you assume that the algorithm is going to make errors, right? And you have uh, extra layers of checks, like a human in the loop who's actually paying attention. Or maybe you restructure it completely, and you don't give the human a recommended action, but instead give them things like, oh, hey, you made a mistake in your draft opinion. You should have uh, done this analysis, right? Because if you don't do this analysis, you are um, uh, not doing the full job that you're supposed to be doing, right? And so that's a very different setup than, okay, here's the recommended action, just do it, you know? Um, and so there's all sorts of different contexts, right? If you're prioritizing enforcement, uh, one of those is, you know, you have this re ranking basically, like in the audit selection context. Um, there is, by definition, a human in that loop. So once that audit gets assigned, that auditor can say, Oh look, this is just this is too simple. There's not going to be anything here. Let's give me the next one in the queue, right? Um, and so there's by definition a human actually doing that process afterwards. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. So so it's a really it's structurally dependent on how you deploy it in different ways, right? Um, Maybe plus two that. Okay. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, what did you make of the recent like, uh, policy letter, and what would what would sort of the mechanisms to implement something like that actually look like? Mm -hmm. That seemed like something that might be desirable and possible. Um, yeah, so the pause letter. Uh, I think realistically, people aren't going to stop training models. Um, in general, I think at the at the layer of just let's stop all model training uh, at this level of capabilities, I think that's really difficult. And, and I'm not sure we have the right mechanisms to do that. Uh, I think it's important to think about the application specific context as well. Um, so thinking about the nuclear <laughs> setting as an extreme example, but sort of other settings where uh, deploying models in that context in that agency are pretty harmful. Uh, if you think about uh, restrictions on companies, and I'm, I'm mindful of the time, so maybe we can chat more right after this. Um, but I think there's uh, having a pause on model training is maybe not the right approach for tackling that. Okay, now we're actually questioned now. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you.